Good morning, Harvest. We are going to get service started here. So abruptly end your conversations. <laughs> Praise your Father. Let's just get in an attitude of worship. Start to focus on the Lord. That's why we're here, right? We're here for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let's just open up in prayer. Father God, we're just so grateful that we can have another day here to gather together as your people. That we find our security and our identity in you, Jesus. That we know that we are loved and we want to spend this next period of time loving you because you first loved us. So we choose right now to enter into worship with hearts of gratitude and thanks and a posture of receiving and giving because you're our Father. We love you and we thank you for joining us in this service. In Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen.
of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my faces roar Hark on the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room. Do 
opportunity to take communion this morning. So I'd like to invite Cindy to come on up and share. And if the ushers could come up and, and uh, distribute the communion. Stay in this place of just being ready for him. I am going to sit. His presence is here. He is here. He is here in this place, so stay in the place of receiving, to just have your hearts open to receive all, all that he has for you here this morning, because you will not leave this place empty. You will not leave disappointed that you will receive all, all that he has for you. So as I was preparing for this morning, the Lord uh, directed me into some things, a book by uh, Bill and Benny Johnson on experiencing Jesus through communion. So most of what I'm reading will be from the book, but it's just very powerful. So just receive what, what he's speaking. Jesus died for our sins and for our sicknesses. Anything that threatens to steal, kill, or destroy our life is not of him. When he went to the cross, he carried with him every dark thing of the enemy. And he was the eternal sacrifice on our behalf. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, in the New King James Version, Version states, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. When we take communion, remembering what Jesus accomplished on the cross, we are repeating the ultimate testimony again and again. Jesus Christ died so that we could be free of sin, sickness, and sorrow. He is the healer, and he's doing it now. So I'd like everybody to just engage and just repeat after me as we go through this. I take authority today over anything that has entered my life. with the intention of stealing, killing, or destroying. I am a child of God. I live in his blessing. Nothing can take from me what God has given to me is my inheritance in him. the cracker and so okay and then repeat this also I take your body Jesus 
in remembrance of all that you sacrificed so that I might have access to your complete redemption and your healing power. So take the cracker now. And prepare the juice. Prepare the juice. And repeat this. I plead the blood of Jesus over every area of sickness, disease, or, or sadness in my life. Okay, and drink the juice. And just one more confession that we need to speak over ourselves and grab hold of this. I lay hold of all the benefits of Jesus Christ's full redemption for my life, forgiveness, wholeness, strength, health, and sufficiency. Yes and amen. So, Father, manifest in this place. Manifest healing. Manifest your word in this place. And, Father, we thank you for it now. We thank you for manifestation of your goodness toward every person in this place, toward every person in this building, and toward anyone who is listening online now or later. Lord, manifest yourself in Jesus' name.
earth replies Holy are you, oh sing it out All the angels cry Holy is the Lord God All the earth replies Oh come on for your presence that's so pervasive here right now. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just declare. Can I have everybody say this after me? I declare victory and grace to overcome chronic problems. Old things are passing away. And new things are coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take, you can take your seats. Hallelujah. Just wanted to give Diego here. This is Diego. Say hi, Diego. Hi. I just want to give him an opportunity to share, see how the Lord was touching him this after or this morning, and yeah. if there's anything on your heart right now. Yeah. So um, I was learning at college recently. Uh, about seventy percent of the United States calls themselves Christians, oh. and um, the amount of Christians who have told someone else who doesn't know about Jesus about Jesus is four percent yeah. of the seventy. So it's going to be even less than four percent of the U.S. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, my friend, that same day, he shared with me of the Red Cross. The founder had a painting commissioned, and it was a huge, beautiful boat and full of it, just full of Christians going about their day, working out, exercising, having fun in community. And as you zoom out from the boat, it's just an ocean full of bodies drowning. And not very many people are getting off the boat. A couple Christians are getting off and pulling people out of the water. And the rest are just sitting on the boat. And... And uh, I cry a lot, and sometimes people come up and like, are you okay? Do you need God to help you? I'm like, no, I'm crying for these people drowning, you know? 
like I'm 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 crying for these people drowning. They're dying. Uh, we do uh, at the school. We have a homeless ministry, and we go out with the homeless, and they're literally dying. Like they're dying of heroin. They'll be there one month, and the next month they're gone. Not like oh they didn't show up. Like they're dead. You know. And and this is one opportunity we have. And so I just keep praying and crying to the Lord to save these people. Not me. Not us. Him. And to empower us because we get scared and we get tired and we get comfortable and we need the supernatural work of the Lord to come through and to change our hearts. He ignites our hearts and he puts love in our hearts and he puts excitement and, and just to, he'll give us that direction if we want it and if we ask for it to go out and to save the others. Amen. Amen. Everybody just stretch your hands out towards Diego here. Father, we just thank you for the impartation that he's giving us to stretch us, to get us out of our comfort zones. Father, I thank you for making this an evangelical church in the sense that you're, we are going to evangelize the lost. And I thank you for the heart that he has, who much is forgiven, much uh, there's much love. And I thank you for the love that he has for the Father. And we thank you for that love being imparted to us. And I thank you for the anointing and the calling that you have upon his life. I just, there is a, there is a structure, a hierarchy of importance that God is arranging in your life. And he's a, he needs to rearrange it in a lot of our lives that we value the things you value, Father. We value the things of eternal importance, not temporary need. So, Father, I thank you for putting that structure in us and in him that values the things that are truly valuable. And that you would make us good stewards of the true riches of the kingdom of God, which is your people. And that we have a heart for the lost here. And that he continues to to uh, fan the flame of that calling. And we thank you for an impartation for him that there would be increase in what you've called him to do and clarity of vision in what you've called him to do in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Well, um, so I need the, the prettiest girl in the church to come take up the offering. So if that's you, please come up here. <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> here, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the baton here. <laughs> Little Emma is not having it this morning. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. This was rolling around in my heart, and I did not know why or how it was going to land until you got up and shared what you did, Diego. So thank you. Because the scripture that I kept hearing for, for the offering was 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 7, which says, Godliness with contentment is great gain because we came into the world with nothing in our hands and we're going to leave with nothing in our hands. So when you live your life with that perspective of my purpose here is not to gather all the wealth that I can for myself to make my life easy so I can live without having to struggle. I don't really need God. You know, I'm good. I'm self-sufficient. There is a way that you can live that keeps your eyes continually on those that are outside of the boat. And it does give your heart this check that it always needs, your motivations for why you need to acquire what you do. And what's the most important thing to give to, to give your life to. And so when I was going through that, I, I just couldn't help but think about the shift that's happened from the older generation to the younger generation and what they perceive to be enough. And if there's any siren call of our culture right now is you don't have enough. You'll never have enough. This is what else you need. How about this? How about this? And it's constant. And to find yourself content with what you've been given so that you are freed up and he can give you the seed to sow. And it's not going to become something to make sure barns greater. It's, it's something that we need to continually be surrendering to the Lord and asking him what is enough 
and what can I give? And so I just want to encourage you with that this morning, that as you're bowing your head and you're asking him what you're to give, that you can begin to find contentment with the idea that I didn't bring anything and I'm not bringing anything out and that I can be content with the clothing and the food and let him direct what he needs to with your finances. And so if you would have the ushers come up, please, or ushers, come on up. We'll go ahead and pray over the offering. Father, I thank you for that reminder this morning why we're here and what is utmost on your heart. Father, that you would begin to plant that in our hearts. That as we look at our days, it's not about what we can acquire for me, my four, and no more, that I can be comfortable. But Father, it's so that we can have a lasting impact to grow your family so that we don't go into eternity empty-handed, but we have so many people who we joined arms with to bring into heaven with us, Father. So right now I ask that you bless this offering, Lord, that you multiply it, Father, that the harvest that comes from it, Father, is great, and it impacts the world. And so we honor you this morning with our offering in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Got a couple of announcements for this week. There are four things happening this week. Everybody say four things. Four. <laughs> All right. So this Monday at 7 p.m., uh, there's the inner healing class with Pastor Rich and Anita, and the topic is on fruit to the root and emotions. So that is the second in a series of four, right? Four. Um, so come to that, and I believe there's, there's probably still a sign-up sheet if you haven't signed up. So um, that is Monday at 7, okay? Uh, also, Wednesday at 7 p.m., uh, there is prayer and worship here at the church. So Wednesday at 7. So we got Monday, Wednesday, and then Friday. Friday at 6 p.m. is the young adults group. So there isn't going to be a Friday night service here this Friday. There's the, going to be young adults. And that is going to be at our house, um, my wife and my house, way over in West Tulsa. So um, young adults, you know who you are, 17 to 30-ish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't stretch the ish. We'll kick you out, okay? Um, <laughs> dinner is provided. So, um, so I believe there's an email chain going around for those of you that are, uh, but if, if, you, if you're here and you're, you don't believe you're on that, uh, or, sorry, text, there's a text chain. If you're here and you don't believe you're on that text thread, for details about that, come see Nat or I. And uh, we'll get you on that text thread. And then Saturday at 9 a.m. is the men's breakfast. And John or not will be speaking at that. So men, come out 9 a.m. Please come to that. Uh, uh, so we got four things. Everybody say four. <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Okay? All right. Let us welcome Pastor Rich up to speak this morning. It's silly, I got to go to work. Can't play with you. Where's Josh in the nursery? Cecilia used to take tips. But she probably wants to hear Grandpa. So. It's an important day today. It's an important day because... Uh, after the service, uh, there's a beautiful cake, cake out there that uh, Larry and Liz provided for their 54 years of marriage. So that's amazing. 
I mean, 54 years is a long time. So, uh, huh? No, I don't know. Bob, or, Bob and Alan? No, just uh, Larry and Liz. Oh, their name's on the cake? I didn't even know. I didn't even look at it. I never know what's going on sometimes in this church. Really. So, um, the way this service is going to come to, you know, an end is that uh, there was a group of us that went to rally for the Catch the Fire 30, 30th anniversary. And it was, a, you know, Anita and I, we went and Dave went and Mark and Katie went, Dan and Jan went. Uh, I'm trying to think of Rich Edgar, uh, he went, Maureen. So all the people that went to rally... What I like to do is have a, instead of having a prayer team, is have a fire tunnel and so that we can give you an impartation because if anything that we've learned through uh, the Toronto Blessing back in 94 was that it spread through impartation uh, around the world. So if you would like a touch and go through a fire, now you might say, uh, Rich, what's a fire tunnel if you knew here? Well, uh, a fire tunnel was something that was, uh, I think, came about through John Arnott, who, uh, when they would go out and minister around the world, uh, sometimes it would be so many people that they thought, this might be a good way to touch everybody, you know, in the place. So, you just, you just go through this tunnel, and people are praying over you, and passing you a hamburger or a hot dog. No, 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 that. But, but just, you know, just praying over you to fill you up. So it's just good to do. Uh, so don't forget that. Go through the fire tunnel, then go get a piece of cake, and then um, go for a walk to burn up the calories. So what did the Lord place upon my heart? You probably are all wondering with great anticipation and expectation. Are you? Because you come to these things on Sunday, and it's like, okay, what am I going to hear? What's the word of the Lord? And uh, so the word of the Lord, I believe, uh, is uh, going from, from uh, plan A to plan B, going and making a transition. And what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, we just heard a scripture about he, all things have passed away. He wants to make a new creation. God takes us from death and brings us into life. God takes us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It seems like there's always a transition that goes on with him. I got born again, and I was so thankful that somebody reached out to me and shared the gospel. And I went from a transition. My eyes were open. My heart began to get healed. Uh, I accepted Christ as my Savior. And boy, everything just kind of changed in my life. So, what's the story about? Well, in the scripture, we're filled with transitional stories. We see where our soul goes to Paul, and, and there's this transition that goes on all over the place, and in our own lives. But today, I just want to focus in on one particular person who had a real experience that, I mean, he... he, he he went in one way and came out the other way after God got a hold of him. And it's the story of Jacob. Jacob, known as the, as the deceiver, known as the supplanter, known as the con artist. <laughs> and, you know, with that, he gets conned by his future father-in-law, Laban, uh, known as the heel catcher, even from the womb. Jacob, known as the supplanter who becomes the planter, the deceiver who becomes the believer. We see here that he had character flaws all over the place. God, uh, but, but even with those character flaws, God made tremendous promises to Jacob. Jacob was in the line of who? Who was his grandfather? Come on, Abraham. And then who came after Abraham was Jacob's dad, Isaac. And then you have Jacob. You realize that in Genesis 28, Jacob begins to have an experience with the Lord. And he has this tremendous experience. 
And it says, And Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went towards Haram, and he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun was set. He took one of the stones of that place, put it, on, uh, put it at his head, and lay down in the place to sleep. Then he dreams a dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and the top reached the heavens, and there was angels of God ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, east, north, south. And in you and in your seed of your families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I lost it. It went blank. Okay, and it says here, and I will bring you back to the land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken over you. God speaks it, but he also fulfills it. God's with him every step of the way. Matter of fact, he gets so blown away by this dream that Jacob awoke from his sleep. Surely the Lord is in this place. I didn't even know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And then Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that was at his head, set it as a puller, put oil on top of it, and he called the name of the place Bethel. Huh. And he vows a vow. And this is his vow. If God be with me and keep me in the way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, Lord, I'm going to give you a tenth back. Interesting. He begins, he, 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 gets, the, he gets the revelation about giving God a tenth back, a tithe back. And all he's asking from God is, I want something to eat. I want clothes on my back. And Lord, I'm going to make this vow to you. If God, you be with me and keep me in the way that I'm going. And keep me, Lord, uh, and bring it to pass. Uh, and then I I'm just going to remember this experience. It begins to change his life. And it began we begin to see that, wow, Jacob is on a journey that God has him upon. And there's no getting off this journey because God spoke a promise to him. And God was going to fulfill that promise. And eventually, when you think about it, the, spoke, the promise spoken over Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, we see that promise come to pass uh, through the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. You're as the stars of the sea. I mean, stars of the sky. Interesting. Acts chapter 3, when Peter gets done and, and John gets done and the lame man gets healed, so much attention was drawn to them that Peter begins to preach a sermon and says this, Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people gathered together at the porch called Solomon, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look intently at us as though some power or godliness made this man walk from us? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus Christ, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One of the just and asked for a murderer to be granted and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of whom we are witnesses, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. 
it's really kind of interesting because here we see that Peter is tapping into the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, those patriarchs of the faith, uh, and we see it through the descendants uh, of Jesus Christ, uh, and we see that Christ, uh, whom they denied, whom they really put to death uh, on the cross, uh, God raised them up from the dead, and God now has highly exalted him that through his name and because of that name, we have power that can flow through that name, and that name is above every name. And that name changed that person in the book of Acts where he just sat at that gate every day. But no, not this day, because this day he met the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that changed everything. And I'm so excited that I can use that name in my situations and everything that comes across my path. I can use the name of Jesus Christ, the exalted one, and I can allow that power to flow through me. Hallelujah. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Don't you forget it. You have been born with a heritage. You have an inheritance. And that inheritance comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have gifts and we have ministries. And we have access into the throne room of God. And I can call upon his name. And I will be saved. And I can call upon his name. And I can come into agreement with that name. And he can get me through whatever he's called me to do. And talk about the one who fulfills the promise. I can't fulfill the promise, but I know that God's walking with me to, to speak over me and to fulfill the promise which he's spoken over me. Okay. Got to take a breather. Hmm. Okay. Okay, a little bit of the backstory. Jacob. Jacob, uh, he didn't have a good, really, identity. Uh, Jacob's name means supplanter, deceiver. He was kind of walking in that. And like I said, he had some character flaws. But it was time for Jacob to come into a much deeper relationship with the Lord. He couldn't get out of it. Why? Look at his grandfather and father. It's not that his grandfather and father were, you know, just Tom or Dick. They were Abraham and Isaac. It's not that he would be able to pass this on to somebody else. God spoke that to Abraham that through his generations, a lot of things would change. So it's not like he's getting out of the calling here. But Jacob had some mountains that he was facing. And, you know, Jacob, he just, I think, we can all relate to some of the things that he went through. The biggest mountain that he was facing was a reconciliation with his brother Esau. What did Jacob do to Esau? Did you say borrow his birthright? Did you say he was lend the birthright? I mean, what did he do? He stole the birthright. Why? Because Jacob came out second, not first. But he held on to that heel. And boy, it started in the womb. He wanted something. God, in his mysterious ways, said Jacob would have the birthright. Even that is kind of mysterious to me. And then the way he goes about it is mysterious. But here we see there where Jacob was given the birthright. And who, who, was his, who was his partner in crime, so to speak? His mother. Now, talk about family dysfunction. Right? But yet in the midst of all the dysfunction, in the midst of how it, was, it went about, God was in it. Everything works together for the good for those who love him. And sometimes I have wondered, Lord, in the midst of all this, you're in it. You want to bring about your purposes and your plans. 
I think about the dysfunction in my own family. Not in this one over here, but the one I grew up in. There's a lot of dysfunction. But when God makes a promise, he tends to bring it to pass. You also had, that was going on with Jacob, was that you had Laban, his father-in-law, who really cheated him for many, many years. This was the father-in-law who gave Jacob Leah when he worked for Rachel. So you see how what goes around comes around? Okay. So God doesn't want to keep a pattern of dysfunction, but God sometimes will use dysfunction to heal dysfunction to bring about his purposes and plans. I grew up in a dysfunctional family, and I became dysfunctional in that family. And I was given a term in counseling, and when I went through counseling, a, a term was called parental inversion. That came from a dysfunctional family, and what parental inversion is, is that a child takes on an identity at an early age of usurping their parents' role because their parents checked out. So see that dysfunction? But God used that to get me where he wanted to be because most, most parentally inverted people take on what's called or go into the vocation of service industries. Police officers, firefighters, pastors, teachers, nurses, doctors, they're taking care of people. Sometimes it's due to wounding. Did you know that most pilots' big responsibility are what's called performance orientated? And most pilots are firstborn. And if you're going to have a pilot flying your plane, I think you want a firstborn because he's going to get it right. <laughs> And it has to be perfect. Now, I just got off a plane uh, a couple of uh, or last week, but I didn't. Ch I didn't knock on the cabin door and say, "Are you firstborn?" <laughs> you see, sometimes how we're raised, God will use, but God then says, "Enough is enough. Let me heal the bad part, and let me bring gold out of the good part." So here we see this, this guy is now facing a situation. And the situation is this. He, he's, he's really, he's had enough of living under the house of Laban. And they had problems. And Laban cheated him like tenfold. And he has enough. And he's on the move. And he's taking his family. And he's taking Leah and Rachel and his whole family, and he, 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 he amassed a tremendous amount of wealth, Jacob, but God was, God was uh, going to even increase it even more. And we see in Genesis 32, so Jacob went his way, verse 1, and get a load of this, and the angels of God met him on the journey. That's kind of interesting. Uh, anybody have any angels meet them this week on your journey? You might have had angels meet you, and maybe you didn't even realize it. I'm not sure. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of the place Naraman. I hope I got that right. Then Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Sea and in the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to Lord Esau. Th thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, I have donkeys, I have flocks, I have male and female servants, and I have sent them to tell my Lord that I might find favor in your sight. So what's he do? He wants to make reconciliation with his brother to go further. And he sends his messengers and he gives a report. The messengers give a report to Esau. Then the messengers return to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau. We also, he also is coming to meet you. 
with 400 men. <laughs> Esau vowed to kill him. A uh, chap, few chapters back. So Jacob isn't doing very good right now. And he said, Esau, 400 men. So Jacob was greatly afraid, distressed, and he divided the people who were with him. And the flocks and the, and the herds of the camels and the two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. Do you think that Jacob is still resorting to his ways of deception? He's falling back on what he knows. And he's basically saying, if you were all part of Jacob's family, you guys go in this direction, you guys go in this direction, and if Esau comes with his 400 men and wipes you guys out, so sorry, but doesn't know about you guys, that's good, <laughs> then at least I have half my flock, half my belongings. I think it was a pretty good idea. It just wasn't God's idea. So that's the background. But something happens. Something happens here. And what happens is that before he does this, Sends the messengers, they come back, you know, they come back, and, and he is like afraid. He is distressed, and he comes up with this idea. So, would it be safe to assume that Jacob's buttons are being pressed out of this situation? You ever have your buttons pressed? Oh, you have Diego? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cute. I saw you take your shoes off because I'm thinking, wow, maybe he thinks this is holy ground. But you ever have your buttons pressed? Uh, I don't know. I think it was, I'm trying to remember, uh, it was around eight, nine years ago. Anyway, I'm in a rush. I'm going out of my garage and I ripped a mirror off my car. I just came out too fast. It hits the corner of my car, on my, on my house wall, garage, rips it right off. Oh, no. Oh, what, what a just a, a stupid thing to do. And those mirrors with the remotes in them and everything, they're like, I don't know, 300 bucks or something. Anybody ever do something like that? Oh, well, thanks. That's encouraging. Around three or four weeks go by, I'm going to rush again. After I get the new mirror put on, ripped it right off again, the second mirror. <sighs> Did anybody see a pattern? <sighs> what a pattern. And, you know, Anita was very gracious. My two sons laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> But they've had their share of, of stuff too. But, uh, but the second time, it just hit my heart. Not the, not the, ex, not the additional $300. Something else was going on deeper than the stupid mirror. Actually, the mirror is not stupid. Then the, the stupid person who ripped the mirror off. So the message being sent to me was that I'm just so stupid and I'm, you know, I didn't go to God with it, but I was leaking out. You know what the term leaking out is? Leaking out is like you just, you can't get it together. You're, you're like Jacob in a way. You're kind of like, I'm sure that people must have thought, this guy is afraid. He's distressed. He has 400 people coming towards him. So I, I end up over that situation. I end up in counseling over it. Is, is that unbelievable? God will use anything. 
And where does the counselor go to? He goes to the relationship I had with my dad and the inability I felt to make a mistake. Amen, Jonathan. By the way, that's Jonathan. He likes to make noises during the service. So if you're new here for the first time, we let him do that. But here the council is going to my relationship with my father and not being able to make a mistake. Ripping your mirror off is a mistake. But should it control me? So the counselor goes to there, and before you know it, I'm back to when I'm like five years old, and my brother made a huge mistake, and he's 18 years older than me, and at five years old, I heard my father say, because of his huge mistake, he wanted to kill him. So at a five-year-old, that then becomes an ungodly belief in my heart that if I make a mistake, someone's going to kill me, which then interprets to, I got to be careful and walk perfectly and not make any mistakes. But then when I make a mistake where I rip off my car mirror twice, now it's tracking back to, and I would advise you, come to the class on Fruit to Root tomorrow night because it's all about tracking your negative emotions and see where they are rooted in. Because that wasn't the first time I felt like this much. That came Years ago. What does the Lord want to do? He wants to pull the root out of the heart where it got there in the first place because the enemy is the father of lies. And what does fathers do? They produce seed, which produces children. Only in this case, the enemy's case, is called the father of lies, which are ungodly beliefs about you. If he can have you stay in shame, he will keep you in shame. If he can have you stay in fear, he'll keep you in fear. If he can have you stay in any type of bondage, he'll work night and day so you're in that bondage. You don't go any further in your Christian walk. I say allow the Lord to take control and allow the Lord to heal the heart and allow the Lord to heal the soul. Hallelujah. So I can walk being free to make mistakes. Not that I like to make mistakes, but being free to make mistakes so that I can walk free. Reminds me of a movie from What About Bob? Your death therapy has healed me. He's, he's talking about Dr. Leo Marvin. I advise you, if you haven't watched that movie, you should watch it. Being free to make a mistake. So like two weeks ago, I was in a rush again, even though like 12 years have gone by. I totally forget my son's car is on in my driveway, and I did what I normally did. I pull out my car and turn it, and I turn right into his car. And that was a mistake. But you know what? It didn't hook me like the other one did. Why? Free. And I'm so thankful that he said that he would pay for it. He didn't want me to pay for it. <laughs> so unbelievable. This is what a kid. I love the kid. <laughs> I don't think he said that. <laughs> but you see, I'm, I'm just bringing you through an inner healing movement. And, you know, that happened with Jacob and Esau years before that. It still didn't go away. He had to face it. And God was basically saying, Jacob, this, you're looking at this as a mountain. I'm looking at it like a molehill. Watch what I do. And the supplanter and deceiver within Jacob was, no, let me figure out a way to deceive my brother again, I'll just divide my family into two. And he'll think he'll, he took care of one, but he doesn't know about the other. No, that wasn't going to fly with God. So what does Jacob do? He prays. <laughs> he 
prays. And Jacob said in his prayer, O oh God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, the Lord has said to me, he's reminding God, return to your country, to your family, I will deal well with you. I'm not worthy of the least of your mercies and of all the faith which you have shown your servant. For I cross over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and, my, and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sands of the sea, which you cannot, which you cannot be numbered for the multitude. So what does he do? He prays that prayer. And when you think about it, it's a great prayer. It's a humble prayer. It's a truthful prayer. It's a sincere prayer. It's a short prayer. It's a faith-filled promise prayer. And he labels his emotions. And is totally honest with God. God, I'm not going to be able to get myself out of this. God, I'm afraid. God, you promised me. God, you said you were with me. God, let me remind you, my, my offspring, what's going to come down my lineage through Abraham and Isaac, be like the sands of the sea. God, don't let Esau wipe me out. You ever remind God about promises? I do. I was talking with him the other day. And said, Lord, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little fearful. I'm a little distressed. I have thought about these emotions and felt these emotions before. Help me track them back. God, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God, help me. Huh. I would say, guys, be honest with the Lord. Even if you don't like him, tell him. I think you, he can handle it. I don't think you would be the first person that didn't like the Lord and what he is doing. Why, Lord, do I have all this trouble in my life? Why, God? Be honest with him and watch what he does. This is an honest prayer, guys, from Jacob to the Lord. It's a sincere prayer. It's only a few scriptures. It's a short prayer. But God heard his prayer. God heard it. And God's a very present help in any time of trouble. What God has called you to do, he'll give you the strength for you to do it. When I first started to do chaplaincy work for the city of Tulsa, I had an interview with the main chaplain. His name is Danny. And he said to me, oh, Rich, nice to meet you. Took me in his office. Oh, I know your son. He's a, he's a police officer here. You did, a, you did a fine job with him. He affirmed me. And he goes, and you want to become a chaplain for the police department and the fire department? I said, well, yes. I feel like this is something that I can do. And I, can, I, can, I feel like God's in it. That's what I told him. And he goes to me, well, you know, I believe you. But can I show you some pictures first? of what you could be coming up against. And I'm like, sure, you can show me pictures. He takes out these 8 by 10s and they're graphic pictures of people who have been murdered, people who committed suicide, people that have been dismembered, all this kind of stuff. And he goes, look at these pictures. I'm thinking, okay. I looked at them and I knew about cleansing prayers back then. So I looked at the pictures, and as I'm looking at them, I'm praying, Lord, cleanse me of these images. 
Honestly, that's what I was doing. So I pass. I get a pager. Remember pagers? So I'm on call for uh, 144 hours, seven days a week. Each chaplain takes one week. You know, the, I think there's 12 chaplains in the city of Tulsa. I get a week. So with much in anticipation, I'm like, wow, I wonder when the beep is going to go off. And uh, it finally goes off. I go on a call. And it uh, wasn't too bad. I mean, it was bad, but I had to do what's called a death notification, which means you wake up somebody in the middle of the night and tell them your son or daughter or somebody died in a car accident or whatever means. And that you need a special grace to do. But then I get a fire call, and in the fire call, something, would happen, something happened with a dryer, the dryer catches on fire, whatever, the victim was in between the dryer and the washer, burned to a crisp. And I'm thinking, this one, I'm afraid of. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. This one, I didn't want to do. This was the, the Esau experience, so to speak. So here I am on the way to this call, and they're they kind of gave me a heads up, and I'm like, Lord, you got to get me through this, and you got to help me. Sure enough, I go in there. Sure enough, I feel God's grace upon my life. No matter what you're facing, he can face it with you, through you, and in you. And though I think of something like that as huge, I tell you, when it comes to the call that got me the most doing chaplaincy work was an infant baby in a bed. That one took four or five days for me to get over. That was the worst chaplain's call I think I've ever been on. Well, there's been some bad ones here in Broken Arrow. But what I'm saying is this. I didn't have it in me to do that, but I had somebody in me that was able to do it through me. When we have that name living within us, you'd be surprised what you can do having that name live within you. Why on earth did God pick me to start a Bible school? It was the last thing on my agenda. But here I am, walking in faith, along with others with me. And if I didn't have Anita with me, and Super Trusker, who's really been incredible at all this, God sends people. To help you, God will send people to help. Jacob, he has an encounter that was famous. And basically, it says in Genesis 32, 13, so he lodged there the same night and, it, and, and took what came to his hand at the, at the present time. Uh, for Esau and his brother, and he now he's given Esau like goods, 200 goats and 20, another 20 male goats and 200 sheep, and he's giving Esau with his servants, he's sending Esau all this stuff, probably to soften his heart, and he's doing all this, that's the backdrop, and, and Esau is, 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 you know, getting all this stuff, and then in the middle of 32, verse 22, it says, And he arose that night and took his two wives, two female servants, 11 sons, and crossed over the river Jabbok, and he, which means to empty. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. So basically, he's to the point now where now everything has gone over towards the direction of Esau, and the scripture says this. <sighs> Jacob was left alone. Nobody with him. No, no wife, no children, no goats, nobody. He sent the dog probably with. And he says here, he's left alone. 
I think that that's the place where God wants to get me to and all of us to. But we are completely stripped, we're empty, and we're left alone. But usually at that time where we're left alone is that perfect time for the Lord to make his strength perfect in my weakness. And what happens with Jacob is astounding. He's left alone, and he gets into a wrestling match. Of all the strangest things. He took them, sent them over, and says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, that's very interesting. A man was wrestling him. A lot of commentaries say this man was Christ. In the book of Hosea, it says and gives account to this wrestling match and says Jacob was wrestling with an angel and his life was breaking and he was weeping during this time. Then Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Starts off at night. Now he's wrestling with this guy all night long. Not the Lionel Richie song all night long, because that talks about having a party. But this is an all night long wrestle with God. Have you ever wrestled with God? Have you ever wrestled with your emotions or your will? Jesus did with the Father in the garden. I think that we, not all of us, but somewhere along the line, we're probably all going to wrestle with God sometime within our life. You want to hear my latest wrestle with God? Want to hear it? Okay, I'll tell you. Remember Vision Sunday where it was like three weeks ago. It was the first Sunday of the month, and I'm giving vision out. By the way, I thought it was pretty good, personally. And I, I uh, patted myself on the back and said, Wow, I think, God, you really anointed that service. We gave out so much vision. And uh, thank you, Lord. You know, I was thankful. I'm at the conference. And I'm in the conference over in Raleigh, and I'm, I'm going through this conference, and around halfway through the conference, I hear the Holy Spirit speak to me, and he said, why did you box me in? And I said, Lord, Holy Spirit, what do you mean I boxed you in? Why, what area did I box you in? And he said, well, you gave Vision Sunday out, and you said in Vision Sunday that Harvest Church would not go to two services. And I said, yeah, I did say that. Um, did you remember why I said it? Because I want the church to remain relational. And it's hard when you have two services because then you have two different congregations. In my natural mind, I think that way. So the Holy Spirit very gently and politely said, since when is this your church? So after I got up off the floor... And you know what? Repentance is interesting with the Lord. True repentance is sorrowful repentance. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I opened up my big mouth and I put you in a box. Because if you want to do two services, then you have the ability to keep this church relational through other means. Because when I started to think about it, doing that, I just stunted the growth of the church out of my mouth, even though logically it seemed like the right thing. So then how many judgments do I have towards churches who do multiple services? And who am I to judge other churches if they're doing multiple services? Do you see the scenario? Do I think we'll go to two services? I don't know. 
How would it even work? We would need two worship teams, two Sunday schools. I don't know. But God does, and if he leads us that way, I sure don't want to stand in the way thinking, no, we can't do that, Lord. So every so often, I know it doesn't happen, maybe once every 20 years I get rebuked from him. No, just kidding. <laughs> Anita will probably tell you, no, it's a lot quicker than that. But you see, who am I to tell God how he wants to run his church and how it should be? Okay? Now, this church is crazy enough that if we had two services, you probably would go to both of them. But at least then I can stand before the Lord and say, I tried what I told him. I, I, guys, it's always a heart attitude. And like David led us in that song today. I don't know who was singing it, David or Shannon. Make room, I'll make room for you. Did everybody sing that with me? That make room song? Well, watch out. <laughs> He might want to make room in you and in me because the scripture says, the prayer of Jabez says, enlarge the borders of my tent. Bless me. Change me. Corral me in. Expand me. Now, I'm not talking that in my belly. I'm talking about inwardly. So, guys, if we're busting out of the seams and we haven't built the building yet to get everybody under one roof, we might have to entertain the thought of another service. But I don't want to box the Lord in. Because ultimately, he is the CEO and he is the senior pastor of the church. I'm not. I just serve at his pleasure. I got that line from a, uh, uh, <laughs> from a TV show. I, I really liked it. <laughs> I serve at the pleasure of. <laughs> so, wrapping it up, think about it. What's happening? He's wrestling with God. I believe it was a representation of Jesus Christ. Could have been an angel. And it says here, now he saw he did not, uh, in verse 25 it says, now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip became out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. You know, isn't it interesting that this representation, whether it was the Lord or an angel, just didn't win the fight the first hour. No, he won a lot of rounds with him. Don't you feel like sometimes you're in the ring and you're going a lot of rounds? <laughs> and when is this going to be over, Lord? But, you know, in the middle of it, the man says to him, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said, I love this intimacy part. And he said to him, what is your name? And Jacob says, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name then. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. I believe that when you're wrestling with God, there's an intimacy that develops with God in the middle of it. Jacob went from supplanter to what? Named him Israel. Israel. It says here in this commentary, the name Israel is a compound of two words. Sarah, meaning fight, struggle, or rule. And El, meaning God. Some take the name Israel to mean he who struggles with God or he who rules with God. But in the Hebrew, names, Sometimes God is not the object of the verb, but the subject. 
Daniel means God judges, not he judges, judges God. The principle shows us Israel likely means God rules. He changes his name to God rules. God has the preeminence. God is the one that has the power. God's the one that has the last word. God's the one I take orders from. God's the one I'm a servant to. God's the one who's called master. God's the one who's called teacher. God's the one who's called the great I am. Changes the character of Jacob into a brand new character that we all in this room can relate to. I am not the same person that Anita married 20 years ago. 30 years ago? <laughs> 40 years ago? <laughs> I am a forgetful person, honey. <laughs> I'm not up to like Larry and Liz for 54 years. Unbelievable. But I'm not that same person. You're not. You wrestle with God, there's going to come a change. You know what he was seeking after this? He needed Esau's forgiveness. Jacob doesn't give up. Keeps it going all night. Jacob needed to know his new identity. Just like we do. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, old things become new. God, in Genesis 35, even reminds Jacob. Jacob, you're not Jacob anymore. You have a new name. Israel, prince of God. God rules. New means fresh, brand new. Jacob stood in the fight, stood in the trial, stood in the test. He got closer he got on a first name basis with God. Jacob had a close encounter with God. He humbled himself. But what did Jacob walk with at the end of that experience with God? He walked with a limp. Every step he took for the rest of his life was out of joint. Reminded him that the old nature is gone. I'm walking with a limp but I have a relationship with God that's closer than anything. It's good to walk with a limp spiritually. He walked with a limp in the natural, but also, I believe, spiritually too. He was reminded with every step he took. You know what happens in the rest of the story? We'll wrap it up. But you know what happens? God softens the heart of Esau. It's beautiful. He softens his heart. And, you know, it says here, he said, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And then it says in the next chapter that Jacob meets Esau. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And there Esau was coming, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two ma maidservants. And he put the maidservants and the children in the front, then Leah and her children, and then Rachel and Joseph last. He crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to him, embraced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, who are these with you? And then it goes on to say that Jacob explains everything to Esau and wanted to give him gifts and wanted to bless him. And their relationship changed. He sees the problem coming from afar off. He sees the 400 men. What's he do? He bows to the ground seven times. Seven times. <laughs> what am I up to? Can you fudge it a little? <laughs> Five. Can somebody pray for my knees? Six. 
I think I could do it. Uh. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. What do you think about that, guys? What do you think about his brother Esau seeing him bow seven times? What do you think that did to Esau? Oh, forgive my brother. You know, that was a big forgiveness because Esau, that birthright, remember he saw for his birthright with tears and could get it back? That was a big forgiveness. That wasn't a little one. That was a big problem. But because he humbled himself, bowed, that finished work of humbling himself after that encounter and wrestling with God changed everything in his life. And you know what? Jacob didn't have an easy after that. It's kind of sad. He died in a foreign country in Egypt. He lost his wife, Rachel, in childbirth. I mean, he had a rough life. Our problems don't go away. But God strengthens us, and we go from strength to strength and glory to glory. And we remember the form of victories to get us through the present victories. Thank you, Father. Wow. Amen.